All right, so let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Okay. Welcome. We have a fun conversation lined up today, but before we jump in, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping items. First, we want to say thank you to all the volunteers, partners, and supporters who have helped us protect the Sky Island region for now 30 years, because this year is our 30th anniversary. Uh, people have helped us both in the US and in Mexico. Through your efforts, we've been able to monitor springs, track the movement of wildlife, monitor species at the borderlands, and much more. So thank you for your support. We also want to acknowledge that the years of conservation science work we've done have been on native lands. The Sky and Alliance office is located in Tucson on the ancestral lands of the Tohono O'odham and the Pascua Yaqui peoples. Before we start the conversation, we'd like to poll which language you'd prefer our presentation be in today, as we know we both have English and Spanish speakers joining. A uh, poll will pop up on your screen now asking which language you'd prefer, if you'd prefer English or not. Um, we'll give you a few seconds to vote. All right, and it is looking like primarily we have English speakers joining us today. Okay, so we will primarily have this presentation in English today, um, but we'll add a Spanish um, translation on our recording to our website later today. So, all right, so we'll be saving time for a Q&A session after this interview. Please type any questions you have into our chat box, which is located at the bottom of your screen in the bar. Um, We'll get to those after the presentation. We will also be recording this conversation. So if you need to leave early, you'll be able to find a recording on our website this afternoon. Uh, with that said, I will now hand over the conversation to our conservation director, Paulo, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Anna. Uh, just checking everybody can hear me. Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Anna. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, I'm really excited for today's coffee break. I really hope you have some coffee with you. Um, uh, so today we have uh, Jorge Obregón with us. Um, and today is gonna be a little bit of a different coffee break than, than um, what we've been having because we're gonna go into the world of art, um, but not just any kind of art. Um, uh, Jorge Obregón was born in 1972 in Mexico City. Uh, his career started in 1990 uh, and um, in the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And he's now one of the most renowned landscape artists uh, in, in Mexico. And one of his unique characteristics um, and part of the reason why he's here with us is because he's one of the few remaining artists that, uh, that he still gets out there uh, to paint. And he gets out there in, in pretty much the same way we do. Uh, he gets out there to nature and, uh, and, and we'll be talking and showing you some of his work and you'll, uh, you'll understand why we decided that he was uh, so, so cool and so interesting that he's here with us. Um, Jorge uh, he uses very different techniques such as uh, all on, on uh, linen, watercolors on paper and carbon on paper too. Uh, but he also works with uh, sculpture and Japanese in painting. Um, now, I'm gonna start sharing my screen before I keep introducing uh, Jorge so that, uh, okay, and hope you can all see that. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, so uh, Jorge went to the uh, School of Visual Arts at the School of National, uh, National School of Plastic Arts in Mexico, which is part of the National Autonomous University, UNAM. And he did art residence in Spain, uh, Finland, and Vermont, among others. He's done more than 70 exhibits individually and collectively around the world. And he's been recipient of numerous awards, uh, national and international awards. Um, so uh, Jorge, the reason why he's here with us today, well, aside because he's a, you know, an amazing artist, but also because uh, Jorge and I happen to just ha have a place in common uh, more than you know we've we i think we met each other multiple times over many years and that is basically because of a place in common that we have that is co um, called the istasiwa uh, popocatepetl national park which 
sorry, I'm trying to go here. The, um, um, and we met, which you can you can see right there at the at the bottom of this slide. Um, so these volcanoes are part of the central uh, system of volcanoes in Mexico, and but they're very close to Mexico City. And as I've been doing, you know, as I was doing over the past years, my conservation and science work in these places, I would get, arrive to the top of these mountains sometimes and always hear about Jorge painting something up there, or I would see one of his models of the park with the, topo the perfect topography of the mountains. Uh, or we always cross paths, you know, in some events. And then, you know, after a while, I started following his work a lot because um, it was just, there, there was something about his work for me being from Mexico City and for me loving these mountains and these, these which are sky islands too, uh, there was something about this place that Jorge could just represent in, a, in such an accurate way, but it's such a, uh, a way that was moving and that was calling to these places. Like every time I would see one of his paintings, my, my, my head, I, I always wanted to go back uh, and, and to go and keep exploring these places. Um, so, um, this, these, are, these are the two volcanoes back there. And if you, you want, I'm, I'm, these, these, these mountains are called Iztaccíhuatl and Popocatépetl. I promise you, don't, you won't have to pronounce them if you have questions necessarily at the end. But if, I encourage you to uh, look, uh, look more on Google Earth and look more about them. They're very close to Mexico City. Most people don't even know they exist. And until not recently, these mountains still have uh, big glaciers. Um, so, with that, and you know, I, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a backstory of why is that Jorge is here, and he generously has accepted to talk about his work and uh, some of his experiences. But we'll basically, basically, we'll be talking about mountains from uh, his perspective. So, welcome, Jorge. Thanks very much for being here. I, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you so much for the invitation to talk with you and share my work. Um, well, Jorge, so. You know, I had this, this uh, as, as I told you, these uh, big topics that I wanted to, be, that we can share. And I'm just gonna be passing the slides of the, of the work and uh, please work, feel free to stop me if you have any comments about anything. But I guess my first question to you was why mountains? How, you know, how did you start painting mountains and, and why? Okay, it was uh, since 1990 when I uh, go inside the university to study arts. Uh, I uh, realized myself that I, I was living in a valley surrounded about uh, many mountains and those mountains were volcanoes from the, the main volcanic range in Mexico. So uh, this valley that it was uh, many, many years ago was a lake. It was formed by five different lakes surrounded by this volcanic range. I realized that the place that I was living I have to study the history, the culture of the, 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 this really important place and space that I'm in, inside living. So the, in the university that I was studying was on the edge of, this, of the city, just beginning the mountain range. So every time that I have a chance to go and make some sketches and drawings, I go outside the school and just go to the lake area of Xochimilco, that's a, the, the floating gardens and also to that volcanic range. So it was little by little that I start um, knowing the terrain, the topography of that huge valley that we have as Mexico City and realize studying the history and the culture, how it was before the city was established and all the culture about the pre-Hispanic settlements, how they get related with the mountains. So that's why mainly it, it was my subject of, of painting. And that's the way I start, you know, painting them and just looking and studying the mountains. Great. That that's a yeah. I, uh, it, that that Mexico City Valley really is something. Uh, and and I feel like I, I think I can understand your uh, yeah. passion for it. Um, so, Jorge, landscapes in, in ecology, so for us, for ecologists and conservationists, landscapes are this sort of like unit of uh, like space, right, that we can work on and that we, we do research on it either because, you know, from a satellite image or because we, you can manage that place in one particular way and you might have maybe a piece of forest or like a, a patch of grasslands. 
But what is a landscape to you? What is a landscape to, an, to a landscape artist like you? Okay, first of all, I feel that the landscape is a place that we all live in, inside that space. And that space, it's vulnerable and we are you know, changing that places with the uh, cities growing and all the pollution. So I think that that uh, sacred places that used to be really in harmony with the ancient cultures and the nature, we are destroying that place. So for me, the landscape, it's that space that we have to preserve, we have to protect and try to understand how nature is, in, you know, as in working with the human culture, with the people. So a landscape, it's, it's a place so that's around us. It's a place where we live. And it's, for me, it's a place that I have to study from the plastic point of view, you know, the color, the light, the atmosphere, all that uh, concepts, I try to put them together in my painting. And also the feelings, what I feel when I'm painting outside there, because everything that I paint, I try to do it, the planner to go to the place, study the light, how the sun moves and, and everything, the atmosphere, you, you, you need to feel, as a spectator, I want that you need to feel what I was feeling and try to, to, to paint, you know, to capture. Yeah, I, I love that too, because you say the light and the, study the light and the color. And I, I feel like that's what we try to do in, in ecology too. Like we try to study, you know, how the interactions within a landscape and how they function and how they're being threatened. Um, so um, ecologically speaking too, you know, from our perspective, mountains now, in the same way that landscapes, mountains are these extraordinary places. Like I, you know, my colleagues can support me here, I think, but one of the reasons why we love them and why we try to protect them is because they're complex, uh, their complexity, right? Like they, they have this biophysical complexity where you can change from a desert to a forest or, you know, reach up a glacier in just a, 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 a small amount of, of distance. And, um, and so they, they host this incredible amount of biodiversity because of that. Um, so, and that's, that's, I think, why we love mountains and why we care about them. What do you seek in a mountain uh, uh, or in a, in a sierra, in a, in a mountain range? Like, uh, like as an artist and as a traveler that, that is, you know, going out to the field for what, what is what is that is most appealing to you, most interesting from a, for, of a mountain? Okay, uh, that's a very good question. When I start going to first time for, to a place, I try to understand the place and study it from, starting from the maps, topography. It's really important for me to understand where is the sun going to go up and then where is going to be the sunset. So all the elements that are together with the mountain are sharing an atmosphere, a color, but it depends on the sunlight. So. It's very important to understand the topography of the place, the sun movement. And after I get this understand, I start to go to different trails or roads that can reach me to a very high point of views where I can reach with my view, all the atmosphere and all the, you know, the, the background, the valleys or the, the, the very far away space that you can catch from the top of a mountain or from the slopes. So I think to catch the, the, the main essence of, of the mountain, you have to be living in there, walking, understanding, feeling the mountain. So I've been working many places around the world, but for example, in Mexico, I like so much the very high mountains above the 16,000 feet that we have in altitude, because we're in a tropical area below the Tropic of Cancer. So in a tropical uh, climate and tropical, you know, terrain, if you have 16,000 feet above that sea level, you get some glaciers, you have some pine trees area, some, you know, very special and unique, um, different, uh, you know, the biodiversity in the mountain. So to enrich my painting, the elements, you know, you can be painting a pine tree and then you have some desert cactations or, different kind of vegetation. So all these uh, gradation of different colors and textures enrich a lot of painting. Yeah, so, well, yeah, that, I mean, that's another great parallel. Um, and yeah. I was just thinking how much has, yeah, yeah, the same for us, like, um, 
And I was just, at the beginning, I was just thinking how much uh, something like Google Earth, for example, like new technologies have changed the way yeah. you go and, and find these places and find these mountains. Um, yeah. You were just talking about the, the high elevations in Mexico. I just want to highlight, this is one of my favorite uh, uh, pieces of view, just because I feel like I, I've been there in that particular place so many times. And maybe okay. everyone that has gone to, to the Iztaccíhuatl knows exactly what you're looking at there. Um, so for everyone to understand, this is this is what probably like fifteen thousand feet, Jorge, or almost yeah, 15, it's it's five thousand meters. So it's like as yes, like a fifteen thousand yeah. or more or less altitude. Yeah. In that place it used to be a little hut where you can pass the night. It was a very small hut, but it was like a fifteen years ago. It was a very strong winds that blow it out and go to a canyon yeah. on the on the on the east side of the mountain. Yeah, you, you can see it like 200 meters below now, the, the remains of the yeah. structure now, no? Um, yeah. And, and what everybody there is seeing, so that, is, that volcano in front is Popocatépetl, who uh, became active again after a, about 100 years of inactivity in 1994. Mm -hmm. And so all that glacier, it had a glacier on, the, on that face, on the north face, and most of it is melted uh, because, part, because of the eruption, but also, you know, because climate change has been doing it. Yeah, important. the climate change. Another thing that it's, I think, important now for the people that are hearing us, it's the name of these two volcanoes. Uh, the mm -hmm. one that we, and I was sitting painting, we call them Iztaccíhuatl, and from the ancient culture Nahuatl, it means the sleeping beauty or sleeping woman. And it's a volcano that it's formed by seven different volcanoes that along the history, of the glaciers and you know erosion make that a strange form as a sleeping beauty and the one that we are looking on the background that we call Popocatépetl it means smoking mountain it's an active mm -hmm. stratovolcano that it's 5400 meters above the sea level so it's you know it's very rich in the different vegetation and different kind of you know soil and temperature, it's a very rich area for studying and yeah. for painting because you, you get a, a really huge distance, point of view from the distance uh, up there. I think more or less it's like almost two, 200 or 300 miles of view if you go, or go on the top of that mountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's always been the saying that if in, on a really clear day, you can, you yeah. can possibly see both oceans on, on both sides yeah. of the mountain. Um, yeah, that's true. And so that, that is a good segue, segue to, I, I actually wanted to follow up on like, so for, for conservationists and for ecologists, you know, uh, uh, you know, one of the, the, we, with the things that we enjoy is like by the, the, how by biodiverse and how rich in species the mountains can be, especially in the tropics or in the subtropics. Um, so do you also look for, do you, do you also see that biodiversity and reflect it in your work when you are painting mountains? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, I I put a lot of attention also in the vegetation, in the the kind of soil and rocks that we have, in the, in the farmlands, what are people growing? So that tell you a little bit more of, about the culture of that place, the climate, the weather. So in in, in a few words, I think the landscape it's it's everything we are surrounded and everything that people need to get from nature in a, I mean, in a good way. So that we can live, you know, in, in a dialogue and a better dialogue be between nature and the humans. And, and in that case, also with the mountains. Right. Um, right. And so, and, and with this, which is also one of my favorite ones, just because, you know, the, uh, I, I feel like I also, I've been there so many times. This is again, uh, mm -hmm. Um, mountains, Jorge, and, and their ecosystems, uh, you know, they tend to be very dynamic ecosystems because so, so many things change at, at multiple scales, like erosion and species are created and then species go extinct and climate changes in, in short distances. So they're very really dynamic. And then, you know, now with climate change, we see them also suffering, well, experiencing threats and changing with deforestation and climate change. But in your work, do you, do you feel like you you try to represent this dynamic nature of mountains, or rather their other nature, which is the permanence and and more like elemental nature of mountains of just being there forever? 
Yeah, I think it's a, it's a it's a it's a challenge for me painting outside because sometimes I get there and I want to, you know, to catch that main uh, essence of the mountain. Sometimes it's the atmosphere, the light. It, it depends sometimes in many ways the time of the day. What time is it? So if it's sunset, it's sunrise. And for example, in this one, it's an area of view of uh, the Pico de Orizaba. It's the highest peak in Mexico. Yeah. It's 5,600 meters. And the main thing that, for example, in that painting is to catch the topographic, uh, you know, canyons, slopes, the biggest glacier that we have in Mexico that it's getting melted. And yeah. on, the, on the background, we can see the, the plateau from the Mexican central area that confluence with the, the Gulf of Mexico range, volcanic, it's a Sierra Madre Oriental. And on the back, it's the Oaxaca and Puebla range. So that yeah. area, it's, you know, we, we have on the backside of that uh, big volcano, we have the largest uh, cactation reserve in the world that it's called the Huacanquicatlan. We have, you know, uh, this fog forest on the left side with the green mountains. And on the right side, it's a, a semi-desertic valley from Tehuacan and Puebla area. So we have very different climates and they are sharing in the space with a very high mountain with the glacier. And also that's yeah. a big contrast in landscape. Yeah, yeah, that, that it, it, this is this is a place just for, for people that are uh, watching this, this thing here. I just, so if you, this is close to the Gulf of Mexico, but on your right, you will keep going towards Puebla and Mexico City, and you will be on the orographic shadow of the mountain. So it becomes, it's drier, and you will have these Joshua trees and uh, some cacti perhaps, and some oak woodlands. But if you go to the left, immediately to the left, and I mean just right there, and you can see what Jorge captured there, that is a cloud forest already. You're facing the Gulf yeah. of Mexico, and, and, the, and it changes completely. And then, to south, if you go yeah, at, at the at the at the yeah at the background, background. that would be the mm -hmm. that would be Oaxaca and the, the largest cacti diversity in the world. Um, so yeah, that is I guess both uh, permanence and dynamic uh, message in, in the same. Um, well, I mean now I you know I wanted to to ask you what characteristics do you think are unique to this to this region where you grew up and where you started learning how to paint and these volcanoes in Mexico, what makes them unique biophysically and culturally, um, uh, you know, compared to, to other places that you've been in the world? Okay, and first of all, when I just go outside the university, I finish, I make to, I need to make a thesis. So my thesis proposed was to paint all the volcanic range in Mexico that runs from the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific coast. It's a huge volcanic range. And that volcanic range, I really want to study and to climb each of the main volcanoes and paint them. Because in that range are settled most of the cities of Mexico and very ancient towns and the ancient cultures were settled there because it's, the soil is very rich in, 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 because the ashes and the, you know, the rock that came from the volcanoes. There are also many lakes, so it's rich in water. So it's a region where we have many, many things that helps for the settlement for the humans. And the interaction between the people that grew the cities and the towns with that mountains get a very specific culture. For example, our food that we eat, like tortillas, they are made with a, the, no, the crops are, you know, uh, break with a volcanic stone. Also, the salsa with the we ate are with the volcanic stone it's made, with the molcajete. So it's a culture that we have in a really big interaction with the volcanoes. So starting to learn about my country, I decided to paint the Mexican volcanic range to know more about uh, our, as I, our history of our country, our cultures, and trying to paint that and to, to show to the people the, the really important place that we live, the really rich place that we have, so we can preserve better and understand better where we're living. So that's why 
I decided to paint that place. And that place was really important for me because when I was in the university, I didn't know that exists that really rich place of the volcanic range. And it's very related with the, the fire volcanic range that runs all the Pacific ring fire. Mm -hmm. And it depends also with the, all the seismic uh, uh, problems that we have, the earthquakes in all the Pacific area. And that Pacific uh, fault that it's called the, the Cocos Plateau that is going under the Mexican country, all the American continent. It's, you know, it's moving every day. It's making earthquakes, but those earthquakes are really related with the volcanic activity that we have. So everything I think it's related to each other. So we have to understand and know better, more better the place where we live to enrich ourselves and our culture. Yeah, uh, and yeah, that's that's something that we have to learn. Well, I'm not in Mexico City anymore, but that is mm -hmm. certainly earthquakes are certainly something that we have to learn to live with. Yeah. Uh, so, Jorge, let's uh, talking about getting to know the places, and I'm going to keep you know some slides mm -hmm. on the on the Valley of Mexico City. But where else mm -hmm. have you painted mountains? When when did you started going to paint mountains outside of Mexico City Valley? Um, okay. Yeah, my, my thesis of this volcanic range was in 1996. So the next year, 1997, I won a scholarship to go to Spain, specifically to the Pyrenean Mountains range on Catalonia, almost with border with Andorra and France. And I decided to paint that place to know, know uh, a little bit more about the uh, how it changed the weather and how it changed the, it, the, the stations from the year, you know, the, the spring, summer, autumn, and winter. In, in the Mexico City area, we didn't have really that changes. Mexico City, we yeah, have, we yeah, it's the dry season and the rain season. Yeah. So we, did, we did, didn't realize so much that changed. So I decided to go to a very, very small town. So 25 people. A town that called Ferrera del Payars in Spain in the Pyrenean Mountains. Over there was an, an art center. And in that art center, I proposed to paint uh, that changes in four months of, of the year. So I, I arrived in summer, I was in summer, autumn, and then I returned in winter. So I was painting the same place, in different stations. So I get this really atmosphere and color change in the landscape. So that was my first project outside of Mexico. After that project, I exhibited that in Barcelona in Spain. And in that exhibition, uh, I was invited by the director of culture in, in Finland to make a, a similar project in Finland. So I decided to go to the Lapland area. It was north of the Arctic Circle to paint the midnight sun in the summer. So in the summer of 1999, I was painting in Lapland that midnight sun, you know, in, in the summer, in in that uh, latitude, so north latitudes, we don't have uh, the night. The sun is just making like an ellipse all over the sky. So at the midnight, the sun make like a sunset and about one or two o'clock in the morning, the sun rises and go up. So it's very special light to an atmosphere that you can get with having no, no night and a full day of sun but there were like three or four hours that the sunset became like the sunrise. So it was a very rich landscape and light that I never before saw in, in Mexico. Right. So as you see, I tried to go and know places very different of my country to know the culture of that country and paint that landscapes. Also after that project, I've been also painting in, in Ecuador in the Volcan Cayambe was an expedition to go and paint the glaciers. And I've been painting also in the United States. I, I won also another scholarship for the Vermont Studio Center. I was painting the Appalachian Range. And it was painting the White Face Mountain and Mansfield Mountain. So I, I was walking for two or three days around this Appalachian Trail in the autumn, painting these yellow and red leaves and all the range of that Appalachian area. It was very nice and very rich for me to, to change my palette, my colors, and try to understand how the, that maple trees and all these trees of the foliage 
in, in autumn changes in the, in the north east of the United States. And after that project, uh, also I went to Japan. In 2014, I was invited from the Mexican government and the embassy to paint some project that can make a celebration of the 400 years of relations between Mexico and Japan. So I was studying the Japanese painters and Hokusai, that was an, a, a woodcut printer in the 19th century. He was painting the 36 views of Mount Fuji. So I decided to paint in 2014, very similar uh, views that he cut, but in 2014, how it looks like the Fuji. So I was one month making these 36 views from the volcano. On site, I was driving all around the volcano and hiking and painting. So there was an, another different um, way to know another different culture at the Japanese culture, but ha that has some relation with the volcanoes. It's very similar to Mexico, the relation they have. The volcanoes for the Japanese are sacred places, sacred mountains, same as uh, for our native Mexican cultures. So all these have been enriching me, my, my soul and my way of looking to the, to the landscape. And one of the latest uh, uh, projects that I just painted was on the Grand Canyon. I was three months living in all this area, in the South Rim, North Rim. I went to Sedona. And also I go up the way up north to Utah to paint Zion National Park. So all these Colorado Plateau area, and I was studying it. It really enriched me, my point of view to look and to and to share with it in exhibition the, this so dramatic landscape that it's the Grand Canyon, Sedona, and Zion. This red rocks area, very a very dry area with uh, semi-desertic uh, places, with the contrast of the north ring with the pine trees and really tall trees. So all these, as you see, different landscapes have been enriching my work. And in every work that I paint, I try to, to, to print a little book, like a memory, where I put some photos of me painting the place with all the paintings that are so the result. So you can see in here in these photos that you're passing. Also in the snow, I was painting in Colorado. I went to the Rocky Mountains to make a project on site. I was painting at like 20 degrees below zero. It was very, very difficult to be painting at that temperatures. But also in the Grand Canyon, I was like in 110 degrees Fahrenheit painting outside, a lot of, of, of hot. So, you know, the weather, the place, everything make a, a relation with me. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a way of work and a way of perceiving each place. This one that yeah. you're passing, that's Sedona. Yeah. It's from near the, the airport slopes just looking to these vortex areas, you know, very special and sacred places, mountains. Yeah, um, I was gonna, um, yeah, I was gonna actually ask you, Jim, you have a lot of work in Arizona and uh, yeah. at, least in, at least in Northern Arizona. Um, uh -huh. But, um, and yeah, I, I, I was gonna ask you, you know, why is, why is that you decided to spend, you know, to work so much there, but I guess the landscapes, you know, the beauty of the landscapes, Okay, that, that's a good question because uh, I, I didn't know new in, uh, the Grand Canyon area, Sedona. For me, that was like a, a new place. So when I was in Mexico, I was deciding to make a personal project, not for any kind of government or sponsors, just for me. So I decided to go and live at the Grand Canyon area for three months. So I bought an RV in Texas and I drove from Mexico to Texas, you know, hitch my trailer and drive all the Highway 10 to the Tucson Phoenix area and then go up to Sedona. That was my first uh, area that I started painting, Sedona. I didn't know that place. I, I thought that I was just going to drive directly to Grand Canyon. But by the way, I was, you know, looking and knowing different places from the Grand Canyon area. So I decided to stop doing Sedona. I decided to go to the North Rim, South Rim, Antelope Canyon different, the Powell uh, Lake, uh, Zion, at the end, it was a little bit more north. At the end, I was, you know, studying the Colorado Plateau. It's a very unique area in the world. That plateau, it's very rich, mountains in this desert, 
in all the climates, different climate that you have. And the light in the desert is very special. As you know, the yeah. sunsets or the sunrises are, yeah. the colors are great, are very different. It depends, I think, in the the moisture that you have in the atmosphere. Sometimes it's so low moisture, so you can see many, many miles away in distance, yeah. very clear skies in the night. So I think there were so many things that catch my, you know, my intention to go there. And I decided to go to Arizona and I really like Arizona. Painting there was really great. This, the three months that I spent there, I think were one of my best months painting outside. Yeah, yeah it's well, good. I mean, I, yeah, the, I was going to leave that for the end, but like you just keep, uh, you skipped us here in Tucson last time. So, um, you know, every time I walk around the Skylands or driving around and I see places like that, the ones that I was telling you about, like uh, the Chiricahua, like every canyon in the Chiricahua or, or Mount Lemon and here in the Catalinas, every time I see those places, I think of your work. And I think that, you know, okay, these are yeah. great candidate places for you and the other way around. So, um, you know, we'll, yeah. hopefully we will have you here soon in the Sky Islands. Yes, it will be really great. I would love to go once again to Arizona and paint. Let's, let's make a plan. Let's look how we can get there. And yes, I can propose to go and paint planner once again in Arizona. I got yeah. my RV in the United States. It's in storage. So I can go pick it up and drive all the way to Arizona and, and, and paint once again there. Yeah, I was gonna actually show some images of your RV here. You also were you you also spent some time in California recently, Jorge. I I, I saw your work yes. there, and uh, and you were there right as the big fires were happening. Um, yeah, it was. I wonder a lot, whether a lot, that, a lot of fires. Yeah, and I wonder whether yeah, you captured that in your work. Okay, that uh, that project was sponsored by a collector, a private collector, okay. that asked me to go and paint his vineyards and all his. He's a huge farm. So I went there, I started painting like two or three weeks before the fires. So I catch this clean atmosphere of the Petaluma okay. River, the Petaluma area. And when this fire starts, I just go all the way to the coastline and I was settled in Bodega Bay. This one, this landscape is with the fire smoke. You can see the smoke. Oh, so yeah. the tones are more gray, like, like in the yellow gray tones. I really, I don't really like to be painting with this light because it's so flat. There's no contrast, and it's not so nice to be like six or seven hours outside paintings, smelling that smoke. So when when the fires came, I tried to go to another places, move myself, to be yeah. not be you know painting with this smoke. This a uh, huge uh, landscape. It's from the San Francisco Bay area. It was painted from the top of the Tiburon Peninsula. You can see mm -hmm. on the right side, it's Sausalito. At the center on, on, on the horizon is San Francisco. And on the left, you can see Berkeley and Oakland. So it's a you know panoramic view of all the Bay Area. Yeah. It's a lot of detail in that work because you know all the houses, the boats, the skyline of San Francisco, the, the, the bridges, you no know, Bay Bridge on the left side, the Golden Gate on the right side. Yeah, so that landscape was a, was a challenge for me because I'm not used to paint that kind of landscape with a lot of houses and details, but that person that commissioned me that landscape, it was a, a huge challenge for me. Yeah, yeah, this is this is beautiful, and you know I spent some time in this area. Thank you. So, uh, this this one too. Um, and well, yeah, here's the the Bay Area again. Yeah. Okay, this is this is one of my favorite views from the area as you know i love to climb mountains to get to the top so i was you know walking in the, the, that area that it's a little bit above uh, uh, higher than the muir woods that it's very famous place very touristic place it's in that canyons on the bottom and that summit it's a tamal pais mountain it's the highest mm -hmm. peak in the san francisco bay area so the thing that i want to paint here is to understand how the bay area is a structure on the right side is the open uh, open sea, it's the Pacific Ocean. Then it's the entrance, the, that channel that forms with the Golden Gate area. Yeah. Then you can see the Tausalito Bay. You can see the San Pablo Bay on the left side. On the, on the back, you can see San Jose, Oakland, San Francisco. So here it's a huge contrast of, you know, the vegetation, no? These canyons, yeah. there's a lot of, of the, the redwoods no? that are 
with these cloud forests, with the moisture that came from the ocean, the altitude, but also if you go to the mountains that go to, to the sun, to the south faces, are yeah. very dry mountains, semi-desertic yeah. also. So it's a big yeah. contrast. I like this this view a lot because it was a very clear day. So you can see very, very far away to the horizon and understand the topographic of a place. It's one of my favorite things to, to catch and paint. Yeah, and and I think, you know, that's just one of the things that I always appreciate a lot about your work is the, the from um, from my perspective, you know, how the, the importance of topography for mountains and how different can be a canyon from a ridge and the uh, mm -hmm. south facing aspect from a north facing aspect and, you know, how the vegetation changes. And just every time I see your work and, and I see every single detail depicted there. And, you know, as you were saying, maybe even the differences in soils. So here's the Grand Canyon again. Um, I, you know, I just feel like this is this is an ecologist that is painting that has the talent that you know most ecologists okay. don't have. <laughs> yeah, I, I've I've been um, talking with very many science scientists of you know volcanic people, uh, ge uh, geological people, geophysics people, and they like my work. They tell me that I catch and I you know I, I put the, the realistic uh, shapes of the from yeah. the rocks from the canyons. And as a scientist, to look that, it, it helps a lot for studying because they told me when they make a photo, sometimes it gets so flat that they don't catch this element that they need to study. And then when I'm painting, you know, the eye can catch so, so many more kind of, uh, number of colors than the camera. And also the yeah. contrast, the details that yeah. I want to put. This one, for example, is cyan. Zion, it's a very great place. That erosion from the from the water, the river area, this you know kind of different levels of soil and substrates and rocks. That's for me it's very rich to be painting these different textures and colors. And for a scientist, it's a very nice place to be studying the geological people that study. Over there, you can see my RV. I have like a mobile studio, so yeah, every time I go to a place, man. yeah. I said, settle everything and put my canvas and start painting, go outside, return to my RV. It's like a way of living outside and be on the landscape very near the place that I need to be working. So sometimes it's the best best way to be working. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, this is, you know, when, when I when I saw these pictures and when, I, when we talked, this, this is where I find, you know, some of the other parallels of, of uh, conservationists and your work and the, you know, or scientists were like, you have to spend uh, in the days in the field. This is from your work in Japan again. Uh, when you have to you know, spend weeks out in the field and, oh, sorry, and this is actually the work that you did in Spain. And uh, those are big oaks. In Spain, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, Jorge, I guess, you know, the, the before we move into the questions, my, my Final questions to you, and it's like after we've seen all the mountains and all the places you paint and all the different landscapes, um, you know what? What we one of the things we value the most of our mountains here is the the way they they connect um, this huge uh, or or really important places in terms of biodiversity of the of the continent, like the Sierra Madres in Mexico. You know that they come all the way from mm -hmm. from central Mexico from the from from the volcanic axis and then all the rocky mountains and all the regions that you've been painting there. Um, and so I guess I, I, I wanted to, to, well, first formally extend you the, you know, the, we were talking about this before, but extend you the invitation uh, to, to come here to paint for the Sky Islands. I do, I okay, really thank feel you, like yeah. this, would be, this would be a great opportunity for you, but also for the region and to, you know, get these depictions and these, uh, get your talent and your impression on on how these mountains connect the continent in so many different ways ecologically but also okay. culturally and i can't think of anyone better than you to actually put all that and 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 uh and you know thank you so much sure yeah um sure. and uh so we you know i i of course want and well i wanted to finish with this this is a the the, the the painting that is in the was at the beginning of the of the of our session. This is the Pico Orizaba again, um, and yeah. so I just I just wanted to you know people to to sort of like look at it again. And this is what you were explaining. If if you uh, folks haven't been down to this part of Mexico, you you really should be uh, going soon. And you know this is 
as you can see the, the Joshua trees and the uh, organ cacti there. The, what you see there are mesquites and oaks mostly, and you know, some yeah. agaves. So, so you can, you know, I, I, I love this as the last uh, slide because, well, almost the last one, because of how similar, you know, this is, this is how you can find a little bit of Arizona down here, or you could say you could find in Arizona a little bit of Mexico up here. Uh, and then the clouds coming in from the Gulf of Mexico. I, this is for sure one of my favorite paintings from you, Jorge. Um, but this is thank you. my favorite one. Um, well, thank you so much, to... Pablo. No, thanks to you. And so now if people have questions, uh, uh, Anna, I think, well, I don't know if we have some in the chat or if people want to just ask directly. Yeah, they, we... they were asking about the link. Um, we do have a couple sorry? questions in the chat, oh. by the way. But... Okay. Um, first, somebody was asking if you could post the name of the Sky Island Mountains near Mexico City because the pronunciation is different or difficult. <laughs> could you could you pop that in the chat, Paulo? That would be great. Yeah, I will do that. And but I should just I should just make everyone pronounce it here. Um, <laughs> yeah, just just one sec. I'll, I need to. Um, I don't know. If any, is there any another question there? Yes. Um, William asks, Jorge, do you work mainly in oil, acrylic, and pastel? And then could you comment on working in plain air in those different mediums? Okay, I'm, in, I'm basically, I'm an oil painter. So I paint oil outside. I take with me my medium, my canvas, and I paint directly. It's oil paint directly on the canvas. And about pastel and acrylic, I don't paint acrylic and neither pastel. I paint charcoal on paper, watercolor on paper, and also the Japanese ink on paper are the techniques that I use for drawing. And for painting is basically oil or watercolor. Okay. And how do you decide which of those uh, to use when you're out doing a painting? Okay, sometimes it depends on the weather. If it's a little bit, you know, a rainy day like this, I cannot take the paper. I, I take the oil. And also depends how fast I want to work, the, the technique that I, I decide to use. So most of the times I use oil and in large formats and medium formats, it's, it's oil and small and sketches are for watercolor and charcoal. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we had a question about your website. I put the link to that in your chat. Um, and it looks okay. like Paolo, Paolo just dropped the, the spelling for those mountain ranges. Yeah. Could you please pronounce those again for us. Yes. So the first one is, is Tasiwatl and the second one is Popocatépetl. So um, the, 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 these are the, the third and second largest volcanoes in Mexico, respectively. The, the largest one is Pico Orizaba, which is the, the one in the previous slides. Uh, and that also has a, an Aztec name it's, uh, called Citla, Citlaltepetl, which means uh, the mountain of the star. Um, and, and these two, as Jorge was saying, they refer to, to uh, laying uh, white or sleeping woman, and then Popocatépetl means smoking mountain. And there's a whole legend behind them. Um, Awesome. As it happens with mountains. Thank you. And then finally, not a question, but a statement. Uh, Beatrice says, if Jorge comes to Arizona, it would be great to do a plain air workshop or meet him. His talent and passion for preserving the landscape and art is a treasure for us all. So. Oh, just, sure. Sure. If it, I, I can make a, a workshop. A plain air workshop will be great to take many artists from the region outside and you know, share our point of views and enrich ourselves. It could be like a one week workshop of planner, awesome. planner painting. Really yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think that would be, that would be certainly great. And, and maybe try to you know, involve us uh, youth as much as possible. I'm sure there's a lot of young people that would love to see your work and, and learn about that, um, both from, from the on Mexico and in the US. Yeah. All right, I don't see any other questions. So I think we'll wrap up a little early today. Um, I do wanna remind people that today's recording will be up on our website later. You'll be able to refine, find this recording and the previous ones that we've done um, on our website. And I will copy that link and paste it in the chat here if you need it. Um, I also took a transcript of today's discussion. So we'll get that up in Spanish too on, on our recording page. 
And then our next webinar will be at happy hour. So offered in the afternoon for anybody who works in the morning. And that will be an introduction to our wildlife monitoring program, Skyline Photofauna. And I just want to alert everybody that that will be available um, on March 11th. So keep an eye out for that. Great. Thanks, Anna. Well, Jorge, once again, thank you very, very much for your time. I know you're in Oaxaca right now and you have to go uh, yes. keep working. Uh, so best of luck. And really, we hope to see you uh, this year, uh, you know, maybe at the end of the year or something. We'll, we'll plan something and we'll let everybody know when Jorge is here so that we can, we can follow his work. Okay, Paolo, uh, thank thanks you. to you. Thank you for the for invitation, for all the, the work that you're making for me. And sure of it, I will be really glad to go to Arizona and paint and share my, my work experience over there. Yeah, for sure. Just know that if you think uh, the, the Grand Canyon was hot in summer, this is, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, Pablo, yeah, sure. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, we'll see you again soon in the next coffee break. Yes. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jorge, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.